Thank you all for coming uh, today uh, to the topic of oh, what we wish we knew then, getting started with acquisitions. Um, Jennifer Pringle and Tiffany Little will be presenting. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to thank our sponsors, Emerald Data Networks, Equinox Open Library Initiative, and Mobius. So I will let Jennifer and Tiffany take over. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Tiffany is just sharing our slides. So welcome everyone to what we wish we knew then, getting started with acquisitions. Um, I'm Jennifer Pringle. I'm the training lead for the BC Libraries Cooperative Support. Uh, we have the Sitka Consortium uh, running Evergreen. Uh, we started with acquisitions back in 2011 uh, on Evergreen 2.0. Uh, with one pilot library, um, and we currently have 25 public and post-secondary libraries using acquisitions on 3.7, um, and we'll be moving to 3.9 uh, this summer. And um, I'm Tiffany Little. I am the acquisition specialist here at Pines in Georgia, and I have been on the Pines team for a little over five years, um, but I worked actually in Pines libraries for the seven years previous to that. Um, I didn't use the acquisitions module when I was in a library, um, but I worked in tech services. So um, uh, in Pines, we have 13 library systems, regional library systems that use acquisitions, and that represents about 25% of all the Pines libraries that use acquisitions. Um, and we are running 3.8 for all of those libraries. So. So today we're going to be going through some tips and uh, good to know things related to the acquisitions module um, to hopefully help uh, everyone else avoid some of the issues that we've run into. Um, we're going to look at uh, funds providers, the mark loader, and certain aspects of the acquisition search um, on a uh, test server for Evergreen 3.9 at the end. Uh, so to start off, some general tips. Um, so when I started uh, training acquisitions, I originally trained libraries on every single piece of the acquisitions module. You don't need to do this. Uh, most libraries aren't going to use all of the features. Um, one example is a lot of libraries don't use selection lists. Um, if you're not going to use that feature, don't use it. Uh, you really don't need to use every piece of the acquisitions module. Um, it's also common that you're going to use different workflows for different vendors, different parts of acquisitions. Um, so be prepared to use um, different workflows. Uh, for example, for some vendors, you're probably going to load mark records, um, while other vendors, you'll be manually creating purchase orders. Um, with reports, there is a uh, link to the wiki on here um, where uh, a couple consortia have put uh, filters and display fields um, for the reports that we've created um, for things like running fund reports, uh, running reports on uh, items that have been received but not invoiced, and items that have been invoiced but not received. Um, so it's uh, lots of different acquisitions related reports there that you can use um, to build your own reports um, rather than starting from scratch. Um, and then one that uh, we just recently found out about um, is that the line item uh, detail doesn't come with an audit table um, as part of default evergreen. Um, if you don't have this, ask your system administrator to add it, um, because if you need to troubleshoot things to do with line items, this is going to make things uh, much easier for you. Um, so we just got that one um, added. Uh, if you could move to the next slide, Tiffany. Uh, so a couple things with administration. If your vendor can send you holdings information in the MARC records, get them to do it. It's going to save you a lot of time. Um, for your vendors, you can define what tag that comes in, as well as specify the um, different subfields that that information is going to come in. 
um, and then Evergreen will pre-populate from the MARC record that holdings information into the line items in your purchase order so that you don't have to manually go through and um, add that information. Um, and we'll look at that on the live server in a little bit. Uh, the other thing that uh, was brought up at one of the ACK interest group meetings is that you can actually enter negative allocations um, if the wrong amount gets put in um, when you are putting money into your funding sources and funds. Uh, before this, we had to have one of our techs make corrections in the database. Um, it's a lot easier to be able to just enter that negative amount right in the staff client. Uh, over to you, Tiffany. So, um, so I'm going to be talking about the mark uploader, which is the load mark order records. Um, and I'm also going to talk about purchase orders. And I'm actually going to turn my camera off because I'm distracting myself by seeing myself. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right. So first, I just wanted to take a look at the actual screen for load mark order records. And there's a couple of different fields on this page um, that you kind of want to take a look at. So how you use them is going to be determined by your workflow and what your needs are. But there's a couple of like almost gotchas that I just want to bring to your attention to be aware of. So the first one of those is down at the bottom, there is a checkbox for load items for imported records, which sounds useful like a time saver and it can be. But one of those gotchas is that what this actually does is when you upload your file from your vendor, um, then in that file you have brief mark records. And I'm actually going to show you what those look like later in the demo, um, but for right now, I'll just leave it at that. Um, so what's happening during upload is it looks through each one of those brief mark records. It links it up to a record that already exists in your catalog. If there's not one, it creates a new one. And then it's also populating your purchase order for you with your titles and quantities and branches if you assign those on your vendor's website. So then what the checkbox does is it goes ahead and loads up all the copies in the catalog for you while your purchase order is still pending, before you've even ever seen it. So this could be a real time saver if you're 100% certain that you got everything correct. But I put a little asterisk on using it um, because you haven't even seen the purchase order yet. Do you know that you're not missing any branches? Do you know that it's 100% correct? Do you know that you haven't over encumbered any of your funds? And you might end up needing to take out a couple of titles so that you can actually activate it. And so the reason that this can be a uh, gotcha is that what happens when you go into your purchase order and if you do need to edit a little bit, the copies are already created in the catalog. So that's an extra step of cleanup that you need to do because if you do delete a line item, you have to go and delete the copies as well. Also, the purchase order already has built-in functionality to check for some of those errors for you and specifically tell you what they are versus that the upload form is not super explanatory about what the problem is. <laughs> so this is a don't check it unless you are extra sure um, because then the process of creating copies in the catalog, um, that's, that's already in when you activate the purchase order, it already does that for you anyway. So take advantage of that built-in functionality that the purchase order already has to do some of that error checking for you. You'll still be able to load those copies later once you have gotten a look and you're satisfied that everything's correct. The other thing I wanted to mention as a gotcha is that once you do hit the upload button, um, you'll get this loading bar down at the bottom. And I know for us here at Pines, and I think for some other places, if you have anything more than like a couple of titles, like three or four that you're uploading, it seems to hang indefinitely. Like you could just leave it sit here overnight. And I have had some people say, I left it running overnight. Why is it not done? And what's really happening is that it is doing all the processes in the background. It's not just, it's just not telling you that it's done. So the page kind of times out and it doesn't remember to come back and say, hey, I'm done when it actually is done. So there's a couple of different ways to actually find out when it is done since it doesn't always helpfully tell you. Oh, I have to find my hand. There we go. Okay, so one of those is that you can check your queue and see if it's done. And if some of you are catalogers, this is probably like old hat to you, but just bear with me for a bit. <laughs> so if you want to go this route, um, you would go to cataloging and then mark batch import export. And at the top, there's these tabs. And one of those tabs is inspect queue. So then you get a grid over there and your queue that you created as part of the upload is going to appear there. 
right there. And you can just tell, like next to the name of the queue, it tells you like a flat yes or no if it's complete. And if it says yes, then you can just go on your merry way, pull up your purchase order, a selection list, what have you. If it says no, then you can double click on that line, which is why I've got those double arrows there. And what that do, what that does is it shows you both a summary at the top and also a list of all the titles that were in the file that you uploaded. So the main thing I tend to look for here really, because I'm trying to tell if it's done, is the queue summary. So you've got a number for records in queue and then a number for records imported. So records in queue, that's how many titles were in your file. And in this case, it's really small, I had two. Um, and then when it's in process, the records imported number ticks up. So um, in this case, my queue is already done, but like if I had 80 records in, um, in my file and the records imported is 60, I know it's not done processing. It's still doing its thing. So I can give it a little bit more time before I go work on my purchase order. The last thing is you'll notice down here at the bottom is that you've got this URL that has like Q slash bib and then a number. So that number is the unique number for your queue. And that just means that if your queue is not done when you check on it, then you can just leave this open in one of your tabs, open another tab and go off and do something else instead of just sitting and waiting on it and wasting your day essentially. Um, so if you just leave it open in a tab and just refresh periodically, then it will update that number of records imported. So if you come back and it said records imported is 80, well, you know, it's done. So instead of having to like go through the whole like cataloging, mark batch, import, export, is back queue all the time, just leave this open in a tab and then you can tell when it's done. So that's one way that you can tell if your queue is done. The second way <laughs> is <clears throat> you can go ahead and just search out your purchase order. So your purchase order is created pretty quickly when you do your upload and it's populated with all your titles, quantities, branches, if that was in the file. The piece that takes a while is that, that queue processing. So the way that I tend to search these purchase orders out is I will put in my ordering agency and then creation time, which is really creation date. And then I just put in today. And a lot of times what I recommend is to set this as a default search because the majority of the time you're, the work you're, you're doing is uploading your, your orders and then searching for the, the subsequent purchase order. So if that's the case, it's kind of handy to just have this already set up that all, the, that all you have to do is just put in today's date. So once that pulls up your purchase order, you can look, I usually start at my first line item and see if it says link to catalog, which means it's not linked up to a catalog record yet. And if at least one of them still says link to catalog, then you're still processing. You're still, it's still doing its thing. Um, and I personally don't like to look through every single line item uh, and see if they're done. Um, we'll just call it laziness, we'll just say that. So what you can do instead is if you do a control F on your keyboard and just type link, then it finds the word link anywhere on the page. And then if, so if it finds one that says link to catalog, it hops right down there on the page and you know, okay, well, it's not done yet. If you don't find any that say link, unless it's like in a title or something, then you know it's done. And if they all say catalog, then you're good to go. So that's just another way that you can check, see if your queue is done. I particularly like control F because I just don't have time to go through every line item and make sure that they all say catalog, but I do need to know when it's done. Um, I will also throw in here really quick, and I didn't take a screenshot because apparently I cut off my line item too far. Um, but if your queue's created and processing, then there should be a link on the line item that also say, does say queue that will hop you directly to your queue and do the same process that we did earlier. Um, and that is totally valid. The only reason that I didn't call it out specifically is because I've seen off and on where the queue link doesn't always appear, even when there is a queue and when it's finished. I haven't really figured out that out yet, um, but so that's why sometimes it, it's iffy, at least for us. So um, also just to note, if you go through the line item queue link, it takes you to the dojo version of the queues, which that's okay, it's not a deal breaker, but just so you know, it looks different. Okay, so as far as purchase orders, um, and specifically about the name of the purchase order, 
So if you haven't noticed yet, on each purchase order, you have an ID and you have a name. The ID, you can't edit. Um, it's the unique identifier for your purchase order in the database. But the name is edit editable. <laughs> you can change it to whatever you want. Um, so having said that, uh, some considerations that you might have when you create your purchase name, purchase order name is the length. So if you are using EDI with a particular vendor, just remember that some of those vendors have character length limits. So if you tend to name your purchase order something really long, or they tend to get long over time, depending on how you create them, then when you send the order off to them, they'll not, they're not going to get the whole thing. Um, they might get like the first 10 characters or the first 20 characters or whatever it is. And that could cause incorrect linkages between your purchase orders or your line items or your invoices. Because when it comes back to you, Evergreen's trying to link up something they don't have both whole pieces of. So they might link it to something that's kind of right. <laughs> um, so when I say you can name it whatever you want, that's just something to consider. Also, keep in mind that um, a lot of people, especially if you're fund tracking in ACK, they do have a specific naming scheme that their bookkeeping uses that they do want to reflect in acquisitions. Um, and the place to do that is usually in the name of the purchase order. So like there's some libraries here in Georgia that are required to use Munis through their county or city funders. And in Munis, they have uh, specifically like purchase order numbers because that's through the county the county uses. So they'll put in the name of the purchase order, Munis number one, two, three, four, five. And that's fine. Um, and so then you can also use that to better match up with your bookkeeping has, or what bookkeeping has rather, I'm sorry. Also with purchase orders, there is currently no way to delete them. So if you make a mistake doing your upload and you use the provider of Baker and Taylor and you meant to use Brodart, then there's no way to change that currently. So if you did an upload and none of your stuff linked up or for you forgot to download the branches quantities from the vendor's website, you can't delete that purchase order. Um, and there's a longstanding bug for that, which I've linked at the bottom of the slide about that. Um, one of the things that we came up at with at Pines is a script that automatically runs overnight for us. It looks for any purchase orders that have delete in the name, that don't have any PO notes, that don't have any line items, and don't have any direct charges. I mean, they're still pending, like that they haven't gone out to the vendor. So for our libraries, there's not a push the button and delete the thing, but they do know that if they need to delete a purchase order, that they have the power to do that. And that's been really helpful for us. Um, I think a couple of other sites may have added that as well. That is something that you will have to ask your system administrator if they're able and willing to apply to your system to use it, but we it has really helped us a lot. Okay, so my last thing before the demo is to talk about invoices a little bit. Oops, assuming that it goes forward. Okay, cool. Um, so, like Jennifer was saying earlier, you do not always have to use every single piece of acquisitions. ACK is a big beast. <laughs> um, it can be intimidating, which can be intimidating that it's large, but that also means that it gives you a lot of flexibility. And one of the things to think about with invoices is what is your goal of using acquisitions in the first place? So if one of your goals is to track your funds and your budget, then invoices are really going to play a big part of that. So one of the things that I think people sometimes don't think about is they get kind of focused on using EDI, like that they're inextricably linked ACK and EDI. But you don't have to use EDI with every single vendor. What you do need to do, assuming you're tracking funds in your budget, is reflect everything that you purchase in acquisitions, whether it's EDI or not, because you can't track what's not there. So over here on the right, I have Fry uh, giving, giving these people his money. Um, and a couple of vendors that I know with some of our libraries at least will sometimes take the library credit card and they go make purchases for materials. So it could be that the branch manager goes to the Walmart every month and picks up some DVDs. Could be that at the end of the fiscal year, you've got money left over. And instead of trying to wait for things to come in, they take the credit card and go to Barnes and Noble or the local bookshop or Walmart. Um, or even if you just make regular purchases off, purchases off of Amazon. So Obviously, none of these vendors are going to give you mark records, so there's nothing you're going to be uploading in acquisitions, but you still need to show that you purchase things. 
So if you had $100 left in your budget and you go to the Walmart and you spend $50 of it, if you don't reflect that back in acquisitions, it's just going to say that you have $100 left. And that's not really true. And if you are said branch manager uh, or you're tracking the budget for them and you do that monthly or quarterly or what have you, those invisible $50 charges are going to start stacking up and your budget's going to be way off. So that's the same idea. If you're regularly purchasing from Amazon, it's the same idea for overdrive. Like for overdrive, if you just get one big bill at the beginning of the fiscal year, you could just straight away subtract it from your budget before you put your budget into acquisitions. But if you get like subsequent invoices from them throughout the year, you need to put that in Act somehow. So one way you can handle all that is through your invoices. So instead of starting at the purchase order part of Act, we can just jump straight to the end and say, I just need to reflect this money in my budget. Things you may want to consider before you jump right into that. Do you always need to show on order copies in your catalog? Is it super duper important for your particular library, if you go to Walmart and you pick up some DVDs, do you need to reflect that title that you purchased? And also, do you need to have that in a purchase order so that you can activate it and have those on our copies? If the answer is yes, then that's fair enough. You need to create your purchase order, write in your titles, activate it, and then turn right around and receive it because you already have it in hand. It went to the Walmart. But if the answer is no, then you can save yourself a little bit of time and just skip the purchase order entirely and just reflect that on the invoice. So to that end, the direct charges that you see on those purchase orders and invoices are configurable. So there's a couple that are already in there in like stock Evergreen, but they're relatively limited. They're mostly for things like processing cataloging charges, but you can add your own. So if you go to acquisitions administration, it's invoice item types. That's one of those things that has multiple names for the same thing. <laughs> You'll see that I'm putting one here for e-materials. I know it's a little, it's kind of little. I should make my screenshot larger, um, but I'm making one for e-materials. So you can also create one for materials, but they're all going to be a direct charge. So if you see on the right, I've mocked up an invoice here I'm using charge type of materials, going to bill it out to a fund, put in my amount. This is like the most basic. I just need to reflect this. I went to Amazon, I ordered four DVDs. I don't need to say which titles I got. I just need to say that I spent 2432. So then you can save and close the invoice. And then down at the bottom, I've got a screenshot from that fund that we used, that AD22, to show you what the end result is. You've got the 2432. You'll notice that it's not an encumbrance anymore because I saved and closed the invoice, closed it specifically, and then it's a direct charge. So whereas you might see that others have that direct, um, I'm sorry, the debit type of purchase, that means they originated off of purchase orders, but this is a direct charge. So if you just need to reflect things in your budget, direct charges on invoices is probably the best way to do it. But if you are tracking your funds and your budget and you don't track everything, whether that's through purchase orders or invoices or a combination or EDI, whatever combination works for your workflow, if you're not tracking at all, then you can't trust your balances. Um, but I did want to just show that when I say you've got to track it all, that doesn't have to be as overwhelming as it sounds um, because there are, there are ways to make it not quite so a lot, um, but you can, that you can still accurately track your balances. Okay, so that is all from my slides. I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer and she is going to start off the demo portion. Okay. Yes. Uh, Give me a moment to share. Okay, I think, yes, that's the one I want to share. Um, so you should be seeing the Evergreen uh, staff client now. We've got a 3.9 test server. Um, I'm going to start us off by going to administration and acquisitions administration. Um, and we're just using Concerto data here that we've added some additional uh, test data to. Um, and I'm going to go into fund administration to start us off. Um, so as Tiffany was saying, the acquisitions module can be used whether you want to track your budget in Evergreen or not. Um, so you can have separate funds for different budget lines, or you can actually just use one fake fund that you use for all of your purchase orders um, and uh, invoices. Jennifer, yes? can, are, you, are you able to Zoom? A little bit 
Yes, let me zoom. Hang on, and I'll just okay. Let me zoom in here. Does that look better? Tiffany, does that look better? Yep. Chat Perfect. chat says good. Excellent. Just let me know if I need to zoom in further. Um so here on the fund administration uh, interface, I'm actually going to take us over to funding sources because Evergreen has an additional level um, compared to some other ILS um, that actually allows you to track not just your funds, but also where the money comes from. Um, so if there's particular funding that you get that you need to track the source of, um, maybe your friends of the library, um, gives money specifically to buy certain types of items, um, you can actually uh, track it back um, to that. Um, and you can allocate, you know, part of the money to your fiction uh, fund and part of it to your juvenile fiction fund um, if that's where the money uh, is intended to be used. Um, if you're wanting to create a new funding source, you're just going to click the new funding source button. Um, put in the name, uh, put in a code for it. We like to put in um, the year as part of the code because there is no year um, field for funding sources. Uh, some libraries will use one funding source uh, for multiple years. Some libraries will create a new funding source for every year. Um, and there's now an active flag, so you can have funding sources that are active or inactive. Um, and then I'm just going to choose my currency here. Uh, by default, the owner is the workstation. Um, if you are a uh, library that's uh, working with a, your, your system rather than a single branch, um, you may be needing to update that owner to be uh, your system. So I'm just going to click Save. I now have my new uh, funding source. And if I click on the title here, I can allocate uh, credit to it. So I'm gonna say the yearly budget is $30,000. I can put in a note. Um, and if I want, I can say when that uh, can start being spent and when it needs to be spent by. Um, and those are just text fields um, or they're date fields, but they just text, they don't actually do anything um, in Evergreen uh, to prevent you from spending the funds. Uh, if you don't fill in the effective date, it will automatically be um, the today's date. So I now have $30,000 um, in my funding source that I can now allocate to my funds. I'm going to uh, close this and switch over to the funds interface. Um, and now I can create additional funds um, if I don't have all of my needed funds here yet. So I'm going to go to new fund and create a fund for fiction. Um, and again, um, at, in our consortium, uh, we have our libraries include their library code as part of their fund codes. Um, we have a lot of libraries that will use, you know, FIC as the fiction code or NF for the nonfiction code. Um, and when we have to troubleshoot, having that library code as part of the fund code uh, makes things a lot easier for troubleshooting. Again, we'll put in the year. For the owner, if you are a system, you might be having your funds owned at the system level. Um, you also might have uh, funds for each branch. Uh, so whichever um, your library does will be what you put in for owner. I'm going to put in my currency type. And I have these propagate and rollover checkboxes. Um, now, these work with fiscal year end. So if I check pro propagate, what's going to happen when I run year end at the end of my fiscal year is Evergreen is going to create an identical fund to this for my next year, just increasing the year by one. So it'll create it with all the same parameters, just the year will be 2023. If I click rollover, uh, depending on some settings, uh, when I do fiscal uh, year end, this will move my encumbrances and or my money, uh, depending on 
how I've set things up um, into my new funds. Um, so these can be uh, very handy, especially the propagate, because it means that for the most part, you can set up your funds once um, and then every year Evergreen recreates those for you and you don't have to manually do that. At the bottom here, we have the stop percentage and the warning percentage. Uh, this can be handy um, in helping you track your spending. Uh, for instance, if I put in 50 as the warning percentage, Evergreen's going to warn me on my purchase order when I've spent 50% of what's in the fund. I can put the balance percentage for, uh, per se uh, to 60 here. Um, so I'll be warned when, it, when I hit 50% and then I can't spend it once I've spent 60%. And I can come in and change these percentages throughout the year. So when I hit the end of my fiscal year, maybe I actually want the balance stop percentage to be 120 so that I can overspend my fund because I know that some items that I have encumbrances for aren't actually going to be received until the next fiscal year. Um, so I want to make sure I'm spending all of the available money in my budget. Um, so I'm just going to save that fund here. And then if I click on the title for that fund, I can create an allocation so I can actually put money into this fund. And I can pick which of my funding sources that money is coming from. So this one's going to come from my City of Fiction. And it's going to be $5,000 of that budget. So I've now got $5,000 um, that I can spend in this fund. Uh, I've got my summary here. Uh, I can see the $5,000 that's come in. If I transfer money be between funds, I can track that. Um, and also once I start fun uh, spending, I'll be able to see the debits for what I've actually uh, spent in this fund. Uh, so I'm just going to close that. Um, and one other thing I'll say about um, this interface, which uh, came with Evergreen 3.8, um, is with this new funds interface, you do have all the fund related tabs together, which is great as opposed to them being three separate interfaces. Um, you also have the library selector with the ancestor and descendant, which you'll see throughout Evergreen. Um, and there's a couple uh, built in filters. So year will automatically filter to the current calendar year. Um, there's discussion uh, ongoing about uh, implementing fiscal calendars uh, in Evergreen, uh, especially those who have fiscal years that don't run on the normal uh, yearly or calendar year. Um, this can be a bit of an issue because when you switch over to the new calendar year, um, the filter does update, um, but your fiscal year might not have switched over yet. Um, so there's uh, future work that's going to need to be done um, on that. Uh, so just a, a heads up, um, if, you, uh, if your funds aren't showing as expected, you might need to adjust your filter. And then on the funding sources, we now have this active flag. Um, and by default, the funding sources are um, flagged to active as yes. So you won't see deactivated, uh, sorry, inactive um, funding sources by default. Um, Tiffany, are there any questions in the chat before I switch over to providers? Nope, I think you're good so far. Perfect. So going back to administration and acquisitions administration, uh, I'm going to go into providers now. So the providers interface has a versatile search. Um, you can search on all sorts of different fields and it also displays your um, providers by default. So if you only have a few providers, you may not even need to use the search. Um, so I'm going to take us into our Midwest tape one here. So I just double click to go in there. So there's a lot of information that you can include in the provider record, but the only fields that you have to include are the provider name, the code, the currency, and the org unit that owns it. Um, you can put as much information as you want in, but everything else is optional. So if you, know, if you have address and contact information that's saved elsewhere, and you're never going to look at it in Evergreen, 
don't spend the time to put it in. Um, so really use, you know, as many of the fields or as few as the fields as make sense for your library. Um, if you use EDI with this vendor, um, you're going to need to include the uh, provider SAN, so the standard address number. So let's just put that in here. Um, and you'll also need to put in the EDI default account. Um, and this is a little bit of a chicken and egg thing because you can't actually create an EDI account until you have a vendor to use with that EDI account. So you have to set up your provider first, then go over, create your EDI account, and then come back and put in that EDI account into your vendor. Um, and sorry, I, I'm using vendor and provider interchangeably. They, the terms really are interchangeable. Um, so if I want to save that SAN, I'll just uh, save that. I'm going to take us over to the uh, holdings definitions. So as we talked about earlier, um, if your provider gives you MARC records and can provide holdings information in the MARC records, this is where you'll set it up to tell Evergreen what to do with that information. So you can tell Evergreen what holdings tag is going to be used, and you can also tell it what information is going to be coming in different uh, subfields. Um, and there's actually quite a, a few different subfields. So if I go into the new subfields there, you can see um, all of these different pieces of information can be included in the MARC record, and all you have to do is tell it what subfield. So if I want to add a circulation modifier, I'm just going to say that's going to be C. Uh, one thing we found with our libraries is it's handy to standardize this across your consortium uh, if you're in a consortium. So have everybody use P for estimated price, C for circulation modifier, um, etc. As again, um, it makes troubleshooting a lot easier if everybody's using the same subfields. Um, so I'm just going to save that there. And then if you're using EDI uh, with this vendor, once you start ordering, you'll start to see EDI messages that um, come in. Um, same with invoices and purchase orders. Once you're ordering, having purchase orders and invoices go, you're able to see the ones uh, connected to this provider. And I'm now going to switch things over to uh, Tiffany. Um, to talk a little bit more about mark order uh, loading. Sorry, mark record loading. That works. <laughs> Thank you. Um, OK, so share my screen again. Share. OK, cool. All right, so, um, so we already talked about the load mark order records page in the earlier part of the presentation. Um, and whoops, sorry. Uh, so we talked about the little ticky box um, down at the bottom, it's a, the gotcha, gotcha box. Um, and what to do if the page doesn't update you when it's done. But something else useful to know is that sometimes you get error messages on this page and it really doesn't explain very well what, what it means with the errors or like how to troubleshoot them. And so the first place you can look for that is in the actual file, in the actual thing that you're uploading. Um, so when you download your cart from your vendor, you're going to get a file with an extension like MRC or MRK. Um, I've seen the file extension of just 001. <laughs> but what's in that file is actually a list of brief mark records of all the titles in the cart. And you can actually look at that by using a program called Mark Edit, and it's free. So I'm going to open it up really quick. I already have it open with one that I uploaded earlier today. I know it's kind of small, but I, I blew up the font to like 18. <laughs> so hopefully you're able to see it at least a little down here is what I'm looking at. So I've got multiple titles. You'll see this is a like a brief record, then I've got a space, then I've got a brief record, then a space and more. So a bunch of titles all in one file. And then at the bottom of each of these, I've got a 962 field. So that's what Jennifer was just showing you. Um, and at Pines, we use 962. I know other libraries use 970. So it doesn't have specifically have to be 962. That's just what we use. And so that's what I put in my, my little mock-up file here. So assuming you can sort of see it, ah, highlight, whatever. Um, 
you can see I've got a subfield B, I've got my branch. In P, I've got my discount price. And in Q, I've got my quantity. So because those are defined in my provider profile, just like what Jennifer was showing you, they correlate to a, like a piece in my purchase order. And so then when I upload, it's gonna pre-populate those for me, which is great. But the trouble comes then when I'm doing an upload and I get an error. And especially like something like the, the dreaded AC import error, which is not helpful at all. So what are kind of, what are some things if you have, if you have access to this file to look at that you could troubleshoot and find out why it's failing? So one thing would be, are you including branch as one of your fields? Does the branch in the subfield exactly match your library shortcode? Like punctuation, capitalization, spacing. Is there a trailing space on the end or on the beginning? Those are super easy to get tripped up on, especially the, the space at the end. Okay, are you using fun? Is that one of those? If you are, uh, make sure that the funds that are that are listed in your your um, your file here, um, are they owned at the same org unit that you included on the form? Just back, back somewhere over here. Where's the form? There. So we said our context org units BR1. If I have funds in this file, they have to be owned by BR1. Um, then do does the fund in this here in your file exactly match the fund code in Evergreen? Spacing, capitalization, all that jazz, that's important there too. And then the last thing that can trip you up is is the funds that you've specified in here, are they present in the fiscal year that you specified over here? So if, go here, and if the funds that are in here only exist in 22, and I put 21 on my form, you're gonna get an error. If the fund exists in both 21 and 22, then you need to make sure that you are specifying the correct fiscal year where you want them attributed. Otherwise, it could put them in the wrong one. If you have 21 on the form, but in your head, you're like, oh, well, these are 22 funds. Well, the form doesn't know what's in your head. So you have to make sure you have the correct thing. It all ties back together. So let's say you upload, you don't get an error, but you upload and you look at your purchase order and there's stuff that's missing, you can still look in the mark file and that can still be helpful for you. So like if you're looking at your purchase order and you're missing branches, okay, well, did error Evergreen give you an error or just were they not there to begin with? Um, if you open up your mark file and if there's anything uh, in your subfield B, maybe it wasn't there. Maybe you forgot to um, set that on the vendor's website. If you are missing prices or it populated with the retail prices and you're expecting discount, are there prices in your, your, your P subfield here or whatever you're using for price? It might have, if you get retail prices, it could have just fallen back here on the, where is it? The O20, O20C, and just put that back as a fallback. If you are expecting your shelving locations to populate, but they didn't, you can check your mark file. Are they there in the first place? Are they formatted exactly right? Spacing, capitalization, all that jazz. So. The, the point of showing you this is that Evergreen can only process what you give it and what you're putting in the form. So it gets the form and it gets this file. So if you start here at the file and see if you've got a disconnect from what you're expecting to what you got, um, this is a good place to start. So even if you are hosted, um, you may end up having to reach out and open a ticket and be like, why is this happening? But at least you can start here and you have the you know, you're empowered <laughs> that you can check and see what it is you're actually uploading. The second thing um, I wanted to show you, my last thing here is somewhere back here, is um, a couple of ways of, let's just say, I guess, creative searching. <laughs> so um, I am gonna go to general search. My intention here is that I wanna either receive stuff or cancel things. So if I go to general search, So receiving via search isn't actually available in the newer search. So I'm gonna have to go over here to legacy. Okay, 
So I'm going to be searching for line items. I want it to match all of the terms that I put in. That's how I search 99% of the time. The any is just chaos. I don't, I, yeah, I don't ever really use that one. Um, but um, OK, so my first term I'm going to put in is I'm going to use PO ordering agency and do PR. And then um, I always tend to put in ordering agency when I do any kind of search, really, because there used to be more bugs around not just not seeing results if you didn't include ordering agency or not getting all your results. Um, so it's just a good habit to, to put it in there. So then I'm going to add a search term for POID. Um, you could also do line item purchase order. And the difference between those is this one brings up like name. It searches by name. Mine, mine doesn't have a name. It's just still four. But um, if it had a name, it would go by this. Um, but I tend to like ID just because I'm persnickety. So I'm going to put four. And either one of those is fine. It's just whatever you are most comfortable with. So either way, I want to specify the purchase order that I'm going to look at. And something to note real quick. So I'm looking for line items, but it's OK to use terms that are not, you know, specifically all the line item terms. Um, line items are kind of like the heart of acquisitions. So they touch a lot of other pieces. So as long as your, your search terms tend to logically hang together, then it's OK to cross into purchase order terms and such. OK, so now I'm going to add um, the line item status is not received. So basically, the sort of formula here I've got is we're putting in a logic formula, and we want Evergreen to return, return the results that meet these particular criteria. So this says, in regular people speak, show me all the line items on purchase order number four that are not received. OK, so let's see what we get. Okay, cool. So this is everything on purchase order number four that's not received. So you see we've got on order, back ordered, canceled. Um, if I didn't want to include these cancellations, like they're just in my way, I could adjust my search terms, add another one, and do cancel reason is not canceled by vendor. So now our new search is Show me all the line items on purchase order four that are not received and are not canceled by vendor. So this works for us at least because we don't tend to use other like cancel cancel reasons other than that one. But if you did, you could just add another search term and add in another cancel reason that you don't want to see. So if I do search. And now I have a nice list of everything that's available to be marked received on this purchase order. So because this is Dojo, we do have that annoying like 15 limit on the page. So instead of like hopping around pages and stuff, I will just receive whatever's on this page that I am looking for. Mark is received. And then it's going to reload. And then it already has shortened my list for me, but if I really needed to, I can redo the search again because what I just marked received, it doesn't meet my criteria anymore. So it's not going to come up on a search. So my data set that I retrieve keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So instead of hopping around on different pages, it's just easier to do another search. So possible workflow for this could be you get a box of items, the packing slip. There's like three or four different purchase orders all in that box. And instead of trying to open up each PO individually, which could take a while and is kind of annoying, I can just search for stuff like this and still have the same functionality of receiving it or uh, canceling it or whatever. And then when I get to the different purchase order, I can just put in the different number or name or what have you. Um, so basically, instead of like going to a purchase order and doing our ticky boxes, if you can just start out sort of articulating to yourself what it is you're really looking for, you can craft search terms to bring you back just those things and it can really speed up your process if you if you can kind of work your head around what you're really looking for. So that's my demo <laughs> and I'm going to go back here 
I'm going to give it back to you. Yes. We have a question in the chat. Um, okay. So you are manually entering back orders, cancellations, et cetera, or are those somehow updated in ACT by the vendor? In the case of back orders and cancellations with the specific can, uh, cancel reason of canceled by vendor, which is why I called that one out, those do come back from the vendor specifically. So if you're using EDI, so when we send them an EDI order and they send us back a response and they say, hey, we got it. Also, FYI, this title's back order. This one's out of print forever. Um, then those are automatically updated. And it'll depend on your vendor. Some vendors can do that. Some vendors can't. Yes. The big ones do, but not the smaller ones always. They do not update throughout the open life of the PO. You get one bite at the apple. They give you that first, hey, here's what's up with the order you just sent in. Um, all right, so uh, before we uh, end and open up uh, for any additional questions, um, we just want to talk really quickly about the acquisitions interest group. Um, so the acquisitions interest group meets once a month via video conferencing and is open to anyone interested in acquisitions. Whether you've used acquisitions for years, are just st starting out with the module, or are wondering if maybe you want to use it one day, Everybody's welcome. It's a great place to share knowledge, bring issues you're having with acquisitions, um, and learn about features you might not be using yet. Um, sometimes it's just really nice to know that somebody else is running into the same issue that you are. Um, and sometimes, like with um, deleting uh, empty purchase orders, somebody has a solution for you. Um, you can also help shape the future of the acquisitions module by participating in the acquisitions interest group. Um, in April, we had a great presentation on patron purchase requests from Victoria Ryan Price from Scranton Public Library. This resulted in multiple members of the group testing out the feature and updating the bug reports. And then in May, uh, Tiffany presented work that she's doing to uh, address some of the bugs that are blocking wider use of the uh, purchase requests um, so if you're interested in helping improve ACK or even just learning more about acquisitions, uh, please do join us. Our next meeting is July 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, the, there's information about joining uh, on the wiki as well. If you join the acquisitions listserv, uh, you'll get reminders of upcoming meetings. Um, as well, you can ask any acquisitions related questions uh, to that list um, and somebody else in the community uh, may have uh, an answer for you. And I'll just put the uh, link to the uh, interest group page into the chat there. Um, and that takes us to the end of our presentation for today. Um, I think we have a couple minutes if there's any other questions. And uh, definitely, if you have questions that come to you after, um, as we said, join the ACK Interest Group or the mailing list or both um, and ask those questions. Um, and Tiffany and myself are both happy to answer questions as well. I'm assuming, Tiffany, based on the fact that you put your name or your email on the slide as well. The thank you was, uh, so you have our emails, not necessarily that we're kicking you out, by the way. <laughs> thank you both. This was very helpful. And I think I'm going to brave it, <laughs> even if I'm a test system. So, <laughs> yay. <laughs>
Test systems are a great place to try out acquisitions, um, especially because then you can try out all the features and decide this has no relevance for me or this is going to be a really good feature to use. And yeah, um, as in the chat, yes, it's fun to spend the fake money. Thank you everyone for coming. We appreciate it. Yes, yeah, thank you.